Well, I, I wish we weren't meeting for the reason and the purpose that we are. You know, during turbulent times, I have found that teachers often find a resolve and a way to work through challenges. And that's what we're going to visit about today. We're going to look at the transition we're all making from our brick and mortar school buildings to differentiating instruction to a new location, which is most likely our students' place of residence. So um, I'll welcome you to this in just a minute, a little more specifically, but as a way of introduction, I, I want to share that in the last 12 years, I taught school short term in Uganda and Ecuador three times up in the Andes Mountains. And those experiences really um, showed me in a very graphic way that schooling is very different in different parts of the world and that not everyone experiences the luxury in education that we have here in the United States. And I know that we're getting ready to go through tough times and I know that you're all scrambling to um, come up with plans and what you're going to do. But I, I know we're all going to be able to get through this together. And I, I think we're better together. And so I appreciate Teresa um, getting this together. She is a wonderful art education leader for the state of Illinois in the Western region of NAEA. And she's very obviously concerned about the art teachers um, in our professional organization. So thanks, Teresa. I'm glad you're all here today. We are in fluid and changing times and what we know today may not be what we know tomorrow. But at the outset of this, I just wanna say, remember to take care of yourself and your families, of course your students, but yourself and your families uh, really need to be a priority during this time too. Many of you have already moved to instructing your students in their homes. Um, some of you are about to do it. I hope that you don't all have to do it, but many of us are scrambling to do that as we um, have this session today. On March 11th, I woke up that morning and I really can't explain it any other way except to say the Facebook posts I had seen in various um, art education groups that I'm a member of for the week or two before that were just um, heartbreaking really to see teachers out in Washington State, California, just uh, having this happen so quickly to them. They were the first ones and seeing their posts and asking for help and not knowing what to do and, and watching the news and knowing logic says it was coming our way. Um, I woke up on the morning of the 11th and I just thought, you know, we can get through this together. Individually, it's going to be hard for all of us to know exactly what to do. But if we rally our art education teachers in a service project, so to speak, um, from art teacher to art teacher, where we help and mentor each other, we help those that are struggling and those that feel confident doing what they think is right for their classes, take a little time and reach out and help others. I, I knew that we would get through this better. So I just took a deep breath the morning of March 11th and started this Facebook group. And initially there was a Google folder you had to email me for the link for, for security or safety purposes. So we didn't have trouble with our folder. And I received 800 emails in 12 hours. And I answered every single one of them, every single one of them. Uh, but I quickly realized that that was a full-time job for a few people. So quickly just regathered and um, changed from using Google Classroom, which wasn't ideal for what we were wanting to do to a Google folder. And then the Facebook group kind of took on a life of its own. And then um, six other art educators came on board to help. And I want to mention their names because they are all giving their time for this. They're not getting anything out of it. Um, if I can remember them all, and I'll do it in alphabetical order if I can, if I can say their names that way. Um, first, we have Sarah Ackerman from Illinois. We have um, 
oh, let's forget alphabetical order. Randy Robart from Ohio, Bob Rieger from Nebraska, um, Kate Miller from Kansas, uh, Marie Taylor from Kansas, and Beth Doberstein from Wisconsin. Uh, all are NAEA members and uh, all of them, I think, but Marie are have been state or and or are national leaders in art education through NAEA and their state chapters and Marie has done quite a bit with me through NAEA and it was important to bring on a, a young teacher I think to um, I, I'm just really big about that I think that uh, those of us that have been in the profession longer need to really be uh, helping those young teachers come up uh, in the leadership ranks with some experience. So I'm glad to have Marie be a part of this too. Um, we, so we have the Facebook group and it's called Online Art Teachers K-12. Online Art Teachers K-12. I have a feeling quite a few of you that are participating in this webcast are members. Online doesn't mean that you are teach, you're using e-learning to teach all of your students. Online just means that we are no longer in our brick and mortar school buildings teaching our students physical bodies in our classroom. It means that we are using no tech, low tech, high tech, whatever tech we need to teach to all of our students. And we're gonna talk about that a little more today. Um, today's going to be more conversational because I heard from Therese when I was driving to Arkansas on Sunday afternoon. I unfortunately had to make it, well, fortunately, it was a good trip, but I had to make a quick trip to Arkansas. And um, that did not give me time really to prepare um, the slides and things that I might have liked to have had for today. So we're just going to be conversational today. Um, and I'd like to start out by just giving you um, what I think are some important tips. Some of these were things that I thought of that morning, March 11th, but quite a few of them have just been gleaned from all of the, uh, the conversation that's going on on our Facebook page and all the mentoring that, that I've been doing with teachers that are really asking for help. And so just a few tips. Um, I think the first thing everybody did was think, oh my gosh, I've got to do all this uh, incredible planning, you know, and, uh, and I saw that happening, you know, in big conversations about how to pack clay to send home and things like that. And I'm watching it and I'm going, no, no, this isn't really a national emergency. This is a global emergency. And the earth has never experienced what we're going through right now because people have not lived like we're living in 2020 ever before. And so it's a very unique situation. So let me just give you a few tips. I think, and these are my opinion, you're the teacher and you can do it how you want to, but, but this, these are my tips. I think that you should keep the planning simple. I think it ought to be good for you and good for your students, but I don't think you should overload them with many, um, assignments and activities and lots of details. I think you need to give them choices. And I know that some teachers don't want to do that. They want everybody to do the same thing. But I really think that given the circumstances and the unknowns that are going on in students' homes, I think giving choices is a really good way to go. I wrote an article and posted it on our Facebook page, I think, on um, March uh, 13th, I think it's there. And it gave some ideas for um, just basic planning for home-based learning. And then it's 30 tips or 30 ideas for no tech, low tech and high tech. And I'm gonna share some of those ideas with you a little bit later. And that article um, I've also started seeing, and I, I don't know if some of these ideas came out of the article or it's just because we're all helping each other and we're all literally getting our ideas, ideas from each other, right? Because that's what art teachers do. So um, we're seeing some amazing um, uh, resources called choice boards showing up. And my article was about choices and now these choice boards are showing up. They look a little bit like a bingo card or something to that effect. And students get to choose which um, assignments they do. And I really like that idea. Um, 
you see, it, we know that not every child in the United States has access to technology at home. We just know that. But we do have schools that have one-to-one -one iPads and are set up to be online at home. And those schools, teachers are actually setting up makeshift recording studios in their own classrooms. And they're, they are teaching their students online. And then other schools have to really differentiate the instruction because some students have no technology at home. Some have access to maybe cell phones and then some do have the internet and that capability. So I think the point is if we give our students just one activity and they all have to do it, um, we run the risk of a home that um, does have internet and Wi-Fi and all of those capabilities doing an assignment without them, or we run the risk of a student who um, does not have those capabilities not being able to do the assignment. So I think the important thing is to differentiate assignments and give choices and then middle school and high school students can kind of choose what they do and elementary school students parents can help them choose what to do. I think it's really important that for the first couple of weeks that we all try our best to be relaxed with our communication and our teaching with our families and our students because there are a lot of varying levels of stressors right now. Students, parents, teachers, we all have them. And what makes sense to me is let's ease into this. Um, some older students are going to be taking care of their younger siblings. Parents need to work too. Um, homes may have normal challenges and normal times and normal stresses and normal times. And so the learning environment at home isn't going to be ideal for all students. Um, there are just all kinds of challenges that can come up from our students doing their learning from home. And depending on what part of the country you live in, um, you may or may not have good access to Wi-Fi. Um, I live in an urban area and we have fantastic uh, Wi-Fi, but I grew up in a rural town and I go visit family in a rural town and, and they don't have the, 100% uh, of them don't have good access to internet. So that's a whole nother issue. Also, um, let's remember that our students are also going to be having um, a very new experience going to school. Um, this is going to be new for them and social distancing is going to cause feelings of social isolation at some point. Um, at first students are probably going to think, yay, no school like this, the kids I've seen running out in the street today. Um, but soon I think feelings of loneliness, not being able to goof off with their friends at school because we know they goof off at school. Um, just missing that human interaction is going to catch up with them. And actually, I've read quite a few articles where experts are a little concerned about that. So, you know, we may have unique um, situations of anxiety show up. It, this may even traumatize some students. And um, so we're going to have to factor that in probably to um, what goes on with some of our students. Um, I think the thing that I just kind of want to drive home is I think this um, home based instruction that we're planning, it can't really just be what we want. And um, I think, you know, I know as educators, we're concerned about our annual reviews and what our administrators think and the standards and you know, everything that's expected of us. And, and now to have parents as partners, there's this added lens of, um, of our teaching, you know, being under a microscope. I just feel in my gut that we need to not worry about that so much right now. I think we need to provide good instruction. I don't think it has to be great right now because none of us were expecting this. It may not be the most ideal instruction you've ever done in a pandemic. You know, maybe the next pandemic will all be better at it. We have to have some humor and we have to laugh a little bit. But I think just don't be too hard on yourself. Um, 
We're also going to see, I mean, I hate to say this, but it's the reality we're looking at that we are probably going to see families that begin to have people that get sick or are dealing with um, financial issues because they, where they work, it has told everyone to go home. Um, a lot of our students' parents are hourly wage earners and I'm already reading about a lot of people being told not to come into work and we can't pay you. So there are going to be all kinds of challenges um, another thing I'd like to recommend is I think completion grades might be a good idea. Um, many school buildings are being locked down and no one can enter the building. Um, that's essentially what's happening where I work at noon tomorrow and I'm reading it across the country in K-12 schools, universities all over. So I'm also seeing that a lot of administrators are telling their teachers that no assignments can be dropped off at the school. The whole goal of all this is to quit spreading contagion. And so we have to just be more creative in how we do things. And you know, I have think the cell phone might be our best friend. So as long as cell phone towers can handle all, all the traffic, all the extra traffic, and I, I think that's a valid concern. We, we may have issues. Um, but why don't we think about how can we use that cell phone? Because all of our students have them. Even a lot of elementary school students have their own cell phone. Um, we might divide students into partner groups and have them work on an assignment together and share photos with each other and peer grade each other's work, of course, with some guidelines we give them. But there's creative ways you can work your cell phone into your instruction, and I'll share a few more of those ideas later. But I just wanted to say it up front because I'm concerned about the social isolation children are going to feel. And I think we can combat that up front by uh, giving them a reason to have to work with the student via their cell phone. It's a partner. Um, in regards to ideas for instruction, there are so many ideas on our Facebook page and other professional art teacher groups right now. I really don't think that any teacher should have to start from scratch today to, to decide what they're going to teach during this period of, um, of social isolation because our social distancing because there are so many ideas out there our Facebook page this morning had over 8,500 posts we're um, tagging them with topics and we're so you should be able to click on the left hand side of our face excuse me right hand side of our uh, Facebook page on your computer and you can see topics and click on them and it will just show you the posts in that topic on the app, it's just right under, I think, the main heading. You see the topics listed. We haven't got all of them assigned a topic, but we're working on it. And um, um, I already mentioned that um, the choice boards and giving choices, and those choice boards could be a checklist. Um, the reason I mention this is on the Facebook page, on the topic panel, which is on the right side on your computer or underneath the heading on the app, there is a, a topic folder called gold with some exclamation marks. And I've been tagging some resources that are pure 24 karat gold for teachers. There, there aren't going to be too many in here, but it's one, it, it's, it's a resource that any teacher could take and use it like it is or adapt it. And uh, so there's some choice boards. There's a teacher who's making a, a video regularly, a little short video regularly for his students. Um, and there, a team of five elementary teachers posted um, an elementary plan for K-5 for the rest of the school year. Uh, and it's amazing. And uh, it's an incredible resource. And you can use theirs for a guideline and do your own. And these five art teachers, hats off to you. Um, art teacher Gullahan and your team, you guys did a great job. Um, also, one thing I think we really have to remember, and, and this is going to be hard for us, but we just have to remember it. Parents aren't teachers, most of them. Um, they're going to have their own stresses, and I would like you to go to our Facebook group page 
Remember, it's online art teachers K-12. And I shared a post by Dr. Susan yelich Benicki, who is on the faculty where I work at Kansas State University. And she wrote a, a very long post and said, she started it out by saying that she has a PhD in education, but she is not a middle school teacher and she will never be able to do the fantastic job that a middle school teacher does because she's not a middle school teacher. She will never be able to teach her son physics. And the post is outstanding. And I have thought of these things, but Dr. Yelich Benicki really wrote it in um, very real terms for what she as a parent, a very educated parent, is feeling at home right now. And so I hope you'll read that and just remember that what we plan for students has to be easy because um, parents just can't quit everything they need to do and sit and teach their kids all day. And this next, uh, this next thing I wanna say is really my personal opinion. I feel pretty strongly about it. So I personally feel like education has got to relax a little during this time period. It's my opinion and I'm sticking to it. It's going to be easier for, for some students than others. It's going to be easier for some parents than others. And it's going to be easier for some teachers than others. And I think that we need to let go of all the planning we had already planned for the rest of the school year. Um, and I think we need to make adjustments that allow for a more relaxed continuation of education, of art education. We're still teaching art. It's just art in a global pandemic. Our field is definitely unique. It's different than um, some of our colleagues um, are dealing with in their content areas because what we teach inv involves all kinds of supplies. And uh, again, I like simple choices for students and their families to make, but you can do this how you see is best for you for your students and your parents. I know we all have to do what our administrators expect us to do. And, and you know, the interesting thing about that is some administrators are giving really clear directions to their teachers and some are giving some general instructions. And we have some teachers that have just been told to figure it out because I think principals are experiencing their own degree of frustration and resources they have available or, or um, uh, staff they have that can help coordinate the technology effort and whatnot. Not all schools have the same resources. Another thing I think that we really have to think about now quick and fast is how are you going to communicate with each student? This is a little easier for middle school and high school art teachers because I feel like you might have that information anyway about your student, but elementary teachers who see their students once a week, we can have some art teachers in elementary that see their students once a month. So um, I think some kind of a, a Google spreadsheet or some kind of a chart where you know the students you can communicate via email, the ones you might have to text. Maybe your school has software that you use and you already have a communication system set up with your students. I had that where I worked in Prosper ISD in Texas and um, I was really fortunate to have that, but I know that all teachers don't have that. I think we have to differentiate communication. I really like this idea and I think for this time period of home-based learning to be successful, we have to have a good way to communicate because it's going to be a disaster and it's just not going to work the way we want it to if we can't communicate. I love the idea that the teacher shared on our Facebook page about doing a video a day for his students and even shared the video and it's short and it's just a greeting and encouragement and it's wonderful. I might suggest not um, making one a day because there's a lot of unknowns. We don't know, maybe you're gonna become sick. Maybe someone in your family will become sick. I think we should be real careful 
about promising students things during this time period. I think saying that you're going to post a video fairly regularly is a, a good way to say it. And then they'll never know when it's going to come and they'll probably really look forward to it because they're probably going to miss you. Um, or most of them will miss you and they're, they're, we'll miss most of them. There'll be a few we, we might like a short break from. Um, also, let's remember that technology is the big unknown in this. And I mentioned this a little while ago, but in my neighborhood today already, we've had issues with uh, the internet uh, flickering on and off, and we never have that problem here. We had a bad thunderstorm last night, so maybe that's what it was. Um, but um, we all know, because we're teachers, and, and some of us have gone through the uh, advent of the internet in our schools and um, in the early days of the internet, which wasn't that long ago, um, if too many students were on, the bandwidth wasn't wide enough and when we couldn't, uh, you couldn't save everything or download everything you wanted to. So I feel like this is an unknown and I think that we've got to be prepared for it. And I think what I think is, <laughs> I really thought a lot about this, and I think that the teacher that plans for 100% online teaching for the next month could find, I hope not, but could find that technology is going to be problematic. And so I really like the idea of choices, and I like the idea of supplying students with no tech assignments too. I also like the idea of giving, getting this all organized and getting it to them up front so that um, if something happened, if you lost technology, if you lost an ability to communicate with them, if you got sick, um, there's a way to keep, um, keep those students that are still, you know, doing great focused on having something to do. And that leads me to the next really important point. And uh, that is that we all know that art is healing. Art helps students, it will help their parents, it helps us. Um, and it might be something that um, during this time period, we might have the ability to cause our students to really fall in love with art during this time period because we planned for that to happen. We, we don't want this to become a time period where students decide they hate art. And I really think how we structure and set it up to give them choices, to make it a little bit fun for them, no matter if they're a kindergartner or a senior in high school, um, give them some choices, 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 and um, that we sort of plan a little bit in advance for the stresses by by um, how we arrange what we ask them to do. Give them opportunities to focus uh, on what's going on in their own life. Um, art might just be the light in the dark that some students might need this next month. And um, on this article that I wrote, it's, um, it's posted on our page, the Online Art Teachers Facebook group page, and Teresa also has it in your resources. But the first of the article talks about some of the things that I've talked about today and, and other things. And then there are um, art projects with simple uh, summaries for no tech, low tech, and high tech. And just very quickly, I just wanna read them off to you. So some no tech ideas are a found object sculpture and I didn't read this anywhere. This was my idea. And you know, as art teachers, when we get a good idea, we get real excited about it. But I was thinking, you know, how could you do sculpture at home? Well, that's hard. And students, how would they assemble things? Would they use tape or wire? And I mean, parents aren't gonna do paper mache and all that kind of thing. All that's over planning. And I thought, why not give thematic themes for found object sculptures? And students can, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ideas in the article, you know, red items, textural items, items that represent nature, items that represent yourself or emotion or items that are metal, anything, give them a theme. And um, students could bind them together with string or yarn or tape or something as long as it didn't damage the objects. But another idea is they could just lay them out on the floor 
in a sculptural arrangement. Take a photo of it. Um, the photo could be submitted to you, or if you send them all with a sketchbook, they could arrange the sculpture, draw it, and write about it. And all kinds of sculptures could be done that way. Kitchen art, why not? Uh, food faces on our plates. Um, scavenger hunts of all kinds with all kinds of themes. Um, an I Spy game written with an art uh, focus. Um, some of these might sound like elementary, but with a little adaptation, it could easily be a middle school or a high school assignment. Making homemade sidewalk chalk and doing a, a chalk mural with a, a theme or a prompt you give them. Aluminum foil sculptures. Um, Sketchbook prompts, of course. I think sketchbooks are gonna be a good friend for us. And these were a couple ideas too that I had. One is an art project in an envelope that you could quickly organize um, some scraps of paper or pieces of paper and a one printed copy, something about George O'Keefe and some construction paper for a flower project or um, a social justice project for a high school student and put it in an envelope and give one to every student. And then another one I really liked was a Ziploc challenge where in our art rooms we all have, or at least I do, I save everything and I think most of you do, but I've got tubs and tubs full of scrap paper and tub uh, cabinets full of embellishments left over from all kinds of things, sequins, pom-pom balls, whatever. And you could uh, just throw things in a, a Ziploc baggie, like the grab bags we see in stores sometimes for 25 cents. And uh, just call it a Ziploc, a Ziploc plastic bag challenge and have students make something with it. An architecture challenge where they draw their homes, or a room in their homes. Um, for low tech, these were some ideas that I had thought of. Um, painting or drawing to music, which we often do. Um, using our cell phones for photography or filming, making short films. The cell phone partners that I've already spoke about. What about a cell phone art show? Um, make a group me and students can share their images. Um, the cell phone, that directional drawing game that we do sometimes where we put two students back to back and one student draws something and then they use directional commands to try to explain to the student who can't see the drawing how to draw it. Um, the directions are in the article if you haven't seen that game before. But what a great way to help break social isolation that students are feeling and have them um, do these drawing exercises together. Homemade shrinky dinks, I just thought of my childhood and how much I love making shrinky dinks at home. And you can make them with the clear plastic trays that cookies come in or sometimes breads, so those real flimsy clear plastic trays, you can make shrinky dinks. And there's a link in the article for that. Shadow art, there's ideas for how to do that. Making sure amplifiers, a lot of times my students do those with clay, but what about doing them with Pringles cans or toilet paper rolls or wrapping paper rolls or any other tube around the house? Um, making a phone stand with the same type of uh, tubes. Trash robots, except of course, these trash items should have no chance of having germs on them or virus contagion. So, and for high tech, oh, the sky is the limit. And we all know that. I have really gotten excited about the app HP Reveal, and I'm using it a lot. Our college is using Go React, and it's a great way for your students to film themselves uh, doing something. Someone can hold the phone on them in the app and film it, and it stays in the app, so it uploads real quick, and then you, the teacher, can type your comments in real time. I think about programs like Photoshop that I've used since Photoshop came out. And you know, I don't know about you, but I bet I use 10% of the capability of Photoshop. Maybe you give students an assignment to become uh, uh, somewhat of an expert on something like Photoshop, where they have to explore it and find five things they didn't know how to do on Facebook. Google Art Project, you could spend forever on Google Art Project. And then a lot of museums have online tours. The online tour of the Louvre in Paris is wonderful. 
Trisha Fugelstad, who a lot of us know, or we probably all know, she's a great resource for high-tech assignments. I've done a lot over the years with Skype in the classroom. It's a, a subsidiary of Skype. It's a great place for teachers. If you've never used it, go look at it because there's great resources for you there. And then I was thinking about MC Escher's mirrored, um, his uh, hand with reflective sphere. Um, where the hand is holding like a metal ball and you see the room all distorted. And I thought it would be really kind of cool to have students find something reflective like a, a mirror they use in, you know, in the bathroom or some shiny object in their house or a small hand mirror or any kind of a reflective item. And they project it on their own room or a room in their house and then they try to draw what they see in their reflection. I think we might be able to teach our students through that exercise that things aren't always what they seem and normal can very quickly become abnormal. Um, and then the last couple ideas were similar to the Photoshop uh, ideas, just doing a drawing app exploration and really becoming an expert on a drawing app. And I gave you a, a resource for some really good drawing apps. And um, building an iPad structure. I had students do this just recently as a traditional project. One of the students took a box and built Monet's garden and had a cutout place to slide the app, um, slide the iPad in with an app that played um, an image of Monet's, the river at, at uh, Monet, where Monet's garden is in Giverney. And then, um, one of them did it like a traditional telephone that you could a television that you could slide the iPad down into. So there are lots of ideas. Lots of teachers are providing ideas. The reason I just briefly want to go over those ideas with you is I think it's really important. I, I really think it's possible that some no tech, low tech and high tech, if you have that option, um, ideas, a variety of ideas might be what we need to do. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, on the Facebook page, I'm going to announce some Zooms I'm going to be doing with first and second year only teachers on Thursday and Friday. I, my heart really goes out to these first year teachers and the second year teachers too because they're just getting it figured out how to be an art teacher and now they have this to deal with and um, we're all trying to figure it out. So I'm going to kind of zero in on those brand new teachers and just answer questions and try and help them through it. So if you know any, the link will be on the page. Um, I spoke to my student teachers last night. I've been keeping them up to date uh, and have communicated with them through some messages. But last night I picked up the phone and I called every single one of them and just talked to them. And I think it was really reassuring to them to hear my voice and it felt really good to me to hear their voice. And we just talked about how we're going forward how the Kansas Department of Education is um, making some adaptations to licensure for them because we're all helping each other get through this. Um, I also like to journal myself and I know a lot of you do. And a couple of weeks ago, I posted on my Twitter account for work that we should all keep journals and we should all write down everything happening in our world, what we see, what we hear, closings, how we feel, and that we should pass these journals on to our children and grandchildren to remember uh, what we all hope um, is something that will never happen again. And so I want to toss out a challenge to all of you art teachers to keep an art journal just about this. Don't add it to one you're already working on, but start a new journal just for this. And on, in, on those days when you have time, work on it. When you feel stressed out, work on it. And I don't know if anything will ever come of this, but I reached out to the Smithsonian Institution yesterday and I did get two emails back from them. No specifics of any kind, but um, I propose the idea that maybe when this is all over and when there's a better day, that maybe these art journals that art teachers keep could become, and even this 
a Facebook page could become a part of the COVID-19 uh, exhibit that I have a feeling the American Museum of History at the Smithsonian is going to want to do because this is unlike anything we could have ever dreamed. I feel like we're all living in a science fiction uh, movie. And I think the last thing I want to say, and then we can visit and we can take questions, is that um, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And I know that we're going to get through this together. And I just want you all to say today that you're going to be kind to yourself through this, because there are going to be professional challenges and there, there are going to be personal challenges. So um, that's all I have. Teresa, do you want to come back on or do you just want me to start us looking and see if we have any questions? I'll let you just jump in. Um, if everyone could just use the Q&A rather than the chat. Okay. Uh, Kristen says, what is the Facebook group? Um, didn't have a pen and paper, but do now. And it looks like someone answered that. Teresa answered that. Online Art Teachers K-12 is the name of the group. And we have another question. Um, uh, yep, someone else wanted to know the, the name of the group. Um, and uh, those are all I see in the questions. Shall I take a look at the chat? Um, let's just look at some of these chat comments. How about that? Um, hello, Kathy from Northeast Iowa. Um, Someone, Deanna, is making a choice slide template for students. Um, she's not finished with it, but um, she's going to share it on tomorrow's webinar. Oh, that's great. Um, I love seeing people recommend the, the group we've started. And um, oh, there's just a lot of great uh, comments and ideas here. Um, I think. Uh, one thing I think I'll add is, I think this is what's really important. This Facebook group was not set up um, because we wanted to set it up. It wasn't set up, um, you know, to create a club or an organization. It, it was set up as a service project. I know I said that at the beginning. It is literally a service project of art teacher to art teacher. And um, we're asking people not to post things for sale. Some of the teachers are putting things on teachers pay teachers that are and putting it for free right now. And then later on, when things calm down, they can go back and, and charge for those resources. But we are really asking teachers to, to step up and help each other. One idea starts another idea and um, I can honestly say I thought the Facebook group would be a good idea, but it has exceeded anything I could have ever expected. And now when I see a post that I know that almost every elementary teacher in the country could use or every middle school or high school teacher, I mean, I almost scream. I'm like, yes, you know, it's amazing to see what's going on. And, you know, I don't want to be an island. I've never wanted to be an island. But some of us are going to be islands in our homes for a while. And um, I think that right now, if we set the bar high on helping each other and sharing with each other now um, and, and not holding back, like the article I wrote, it might have been good for me to submit that to a, a journal or a magazine. I would have done a little more work on it, probably to put it in a journal. But instead, I just wanted to put it out there for you. Um, and um, there are so many people out there doing things. There, um, there's lots of organizations that we know about that are doing amazing things. And we're sharing all of their resources on our page too, on our group. So Teresa, that's about all I have. What do you think? Uh, well, there's actually a couple more questions oh, in the Q&A. Okay, good. Let's take a look at them. Um, okay, has anyone thought seriously about how to get supplies to our less fortunate students? I touch on that in the article. So here's the thing about that. Some schools have very strict guidelines. Um, for instance, um, I believe it was Bob Reeker that said his school students could only use paper and pencil. 
or else it's someone he's very close to. But I think that came down a pipe from him to me. But I've started reading it other places too. So I think this is the hardest part for some art teachers. I think we've got to get our brains off of needing all these supplies. If you read the article that I wrote, it's going to get you thinking about what students already have in the house. Um, and by letting them make choices, you don't have to um, provide all kinds of supplies. Now, one thing that a lot of schools are doing all over the country is administrators are running a program where they're putting together a packet for every student and there is a, a pickup day. Uh, elementary students, parents come pick up their packet, they check it off. Middle school students, parents pick up, they check it off. High school students can pick up their own. But there's a lot of that going on all over the country. And I really like that idea, but it has to be able to fit in these schools in a big um, a manila envelope. So um, I want you to do this how you want to do it, but I think you're going to stress yourself out uh, in a way you don't need to if you're really trying to get um, a lot of supplies home to students. The Ziploc baggie idea I had would be a flat idea that would slide in an envelope. Maybe you do your own envelopes and, and you have a pickup day um, of some kind. But all of this is going to get a little touchy because some schools are saying we can't be on campus much anymore or at all. I hope that helps. Um, is any other state having the no grade policy? Uh, yes, uh, it is all over the country. We're reading different things. Um, we're also reading some states have um, uh, canceled standardized testing for this spring. So there's a lot of a lot of differences going on. And you know, it doesn't really matter what other states are doing because as a teacher of license in the state you're in, you're gonna have to do what your state says. So you need to be the most familiar with what's going on with your state. Grading is gonna be a big issue and I think we're gonna see it um, kind of become uh, a little um, less structured than it normally is. Okay. All right, well, I guess I will jump on officially. Um, thank you everybody for coming on. So we had a really good big group of people here, a lot of good participation in the chats, which I think that was awesome. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Trina, for willing to jump in and help out. And um, I know I feel a little bit more at ease, you know, I think it's good. You know, it's why are we stressing ourselves out? Let's let's you yeah. know think about it. Let's not you know just throw anything up there, but let's make it meaningful. But at the same time, it's going to be okay. Um, I have a, a high schooler and a middle schooler, and my high schooler is like they're giving me so much work, and he's down. I'm like, well, it's kind of like you're in school, but it doesn't matter to them. They're like, this is too much work. So, mm -hmm. um, I think just keeping like we have a limit of thirty minutes. You know, just if mm -hmm. the kids work longer, great. But mm -hmm. you know as long as you make something meaningful and you know i think even balancing between art making and then critical thinking isn't a bad thing either so yes. you know yes yes and and social emotional learning activities because i i think that that's i think the one the one thing that if we plan right in this time period the art assignment students have to do if we weave some sel into it we're, I think we're going to provide whole families with a way to breathe because students might tell their parents what they did or vice versa, you know, so. All right, thank you so much. I, um, I, I'm happy to just share with you some of my thoughts and ideas based on all of the years I've been a teacher and these experiences I had teaching in other countries where I didn't have resources. Um, um, but I know Teresa feels the same way. We just wish we weren't having to do this. I, we wish we were at school having to, you know, get that student to put the X-Acto knife back where it goes. You know, um, we, uh, one last thing, I, I heard this on TV the other day. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if during this time period, if we as teachers, create an environment through whatever content we teach 
where we teach our students to be more altruistic and less, less self-centered and where we as, as human beings, as teachers, where even we become more altruistic. So maybe after all this is over and we can all return to a normal life that we all hope to have, maybe we might all be a little better human beings for experiencing this. So thank you so much.